Assalamu alaikum and a good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome from IEEE Antenna Propagation, MTT, and EMC chapter at Islamabad, uh, which is hosted by uh, Research Institute for Microwave and Millimeter Wave Studies at National University of Sciences and Technology. Uh, so today's talk is on advances in antenna system for future wireless system, uh, which is given by uh, Professor Mohammad Sharabi uh, from Electrical Engineering Department, uh, Polytechnic Montreal, Canada. Uh, uh, we are very happy to have him uh, today with us. Uh, so Dr. Sharabi is a professor of Electrical Engineering at Polytechnic Montreal, uh, Canada. He is also a member of Polygram's Research Center. Uh, he was with King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, Saudi Arabia between 2009 and 2018. He founded and directed the Antenna and Microwave Structure Design Laboratory at KFUPM. He was a visiting professor at the Intelligent Radio Laboratory uh, in the Electrical Engineering Department of the University of Calgary in Canada during the summer and fall of 2014. He was a visiting research professor at Oakland University uh, during the summer of 2013. Professor Sharabi's area of, of research and in, uh, interest include multi-band printed MIMO antennas, reconfigurable and active integrated antennas, applied electromagnetics, uh, millimeter wave MIMO antennas, and integrated 4G, 5G antennas for wireless uh, handset and access point. He has uh, more than 300 papers published in referred journals and international conferences, 10 book chapters, one single authored book entitled Printed MIMO Antenna Engineering by Our Tech House in 2014, and uh, the lead author of the recent book, uh, Design and Application of Active Integrated Antennas. Uh, he has 20 issued and 15 pending patents in the US Patent Office. He is serving as the associate editor of IEEE Antenna and Wireless Propagation Letters, IT Microwave Antennas and Propagation, and it's also an area editor of Wiley Microwave and Optical Technology Letters. Professor Chiravi is a special specialty chief editor of the newly launched Frontier Journal on Communication and Network for the System and Testbed Design section. He served on the technical and organizational program committees of several international conferences, such as EUCAP, APS, IMS, APCAP, IWAT, among many others. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, giving us time and uh, giving us this uh, talk. So now I'll give you uh, the floor uh, to please present your uh, presentation on advances in antenna system for future wireless communication. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khan, for this uh, uh, introduction. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, always a pleasure. Uh, I would like to also thank the IEEE, AP, MTT, and EMC chapters of uh, Islamabad for uh, inviting me to give this talk. So, uh, um, as Dr. Khan mentioned, uh, today I will uh, focus on uh, some of the advancements in antenna systems um, um, that we have been um, carrying over uh, during the past years for the future of uh, 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 wireless communication systems. I'm going to touch upon applications mainly for the mobile handsets, but also I will touch upon uh, um, um, several applications that are uh, for base stations as well as some other applications. So the scope of the presentation will be as follows. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction about our research lab and activities here at Polytechnic Montreal uh, and a brief introduction about Polytechnic Montreal itself. Then I'm going to go over some of the uh, um, needs and features and technology trends uh, um, that um, are expected from 5G uh, and future wireless systems. Then I'm going to focus on the antenna systems themselves, especially for 5G. Uh, there are two major technologies that are going to make uh, uh, 5G uh, uh, a reality from an antenna point of view. Uh, and these two main technologies that I'm going to focus on are multiple input, multiple output systems or technology uh, within which we will talk about a little bit massive MIMO as well as millimeter wave technology, uh, which is basically focusing on higher frequency bands to get to higher bandwidths. Then I'm going to go over several applications and several examples um, um, that uh, we have targeted uh, uh, during the past years 
uh, with uh, a lot of my previous students uh, um, trying to come up with some novel antenna solutions that can have and provide the specs and the features that are needed to make 5G and beyond a reality. And then I'm going to uh, conclude with some future challenges. So basically, starting with uh, where is Polytechnic Montreal, as you can see here on a Google map, uh, it's in Quebec, Canada. Uh, basically, it was founded in 1873. So it's one of it's one of the oldest engineering schools uh, in the province and in Canada as well. The University of it's 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 the university. Well, Polytechnic Montreal is part of the University of Montreal Engineering School. So the University of Montreal actually has three sections. The University of Montreal. Polytechnic Montreal, which is only engineering, and then there is also H H HEC, uh, which handles the business school. So Polytechnic Montreal is the engineering school of the University of Montreal. We are uh, a kind of a, a, an independent entity, but we are under the umbrella and governance of the University of Montreal. Um, we have seven engineering departments um, with about a population of 8,000 students, and the electrical engineering in particular is about uh, one tenth uh, of, of, of the total population of the school with about 700 students and 150 grad students. Um, this is uh, just a, a night view in the winter with some snow of our uh, two main buildings at Polytechnic Montreal. Now, some of the research activities that my group is involved in um, um, basically spans through the uh, the the coming up with novel MIMO antenna systems, whether it's for handsets, base stations. Um, we are, have also done a lot of work on RF sensors and sensor arrays for oil and gas technologies, especially when I was at KFUPM. And also we have tackled several biomedical based applications. Of course, when we design antennas, we need to come up with some novel geometries, novel miniaturization, uh, methods and integration uh, uh, um, schemes. We have also done a lot of antenna arrays with beam steering algorithms for different applications, whether we're talking about linear or planar arrays, and also some fundamental applied electromagnetics where we have touched upon uh, the theory of characteristic modes, characteristic based functions, and the antenna current green functions. These are some sample uh, designs and examples of the span of work that my group has been involved in uh, over the years uh, from um, um, cognitive radio reconfigurable MIMO. I will come to this later in our my talk, as well as millimeter wave MIMO based on cylindrical dielectric resonator antennas. And lastly, the actual sensor arrays that we have done for oil and gas applications. Of course, in, in, in Polytechnic, the, the, the research model or the, res the professors have a different uh, a kind of a, a research model. We actually share one big lab. So there is one big lab called the Polygrams Research Center where each professor actually pours in his or her grant money to buy in some new equipment and complement the capabilities of the other professors and the, and the lab itself. So currently, uh, we can measure up to one terahertz uh, um, of on chip, on package uh, uh, based uh, antennas and circuitry. Um, we can measure radiation patterns up to 500 gigahertz with custom setups. We have all kinds of CAD tools and design resources. I have recently added a new reverberation chamber, the only one in an academic institution in Canada that can actually measure up to 8x8 eight eight MIMO at sub 6 gigahertz and 2x2 two two MIMO at millimeter waves. This is extremely important to characterize 5G and future antenna systems. Of course, we have a clean room and more than 50 graduate students. And as you can see here, there are, see, there are some pictures from our lab, and this is the recent reverberation chamber that we have acquired. Now, our research and our work is always driven by the market and by the technology needs. And as all of you are aware of, you know, some of you have actually lived and used these kinds of uh, uh, um, um, ancient uh, gadgets uh, when we were uh, uh, in the university back in the 90s and the, and, and the 2000s, uh, where we used mainly these kinds of uh, cell phones that were only 
able to send some text messages and some basic multimedia features. And the majority of the audience, I assume that have have been actually living within the area of 4G, where now we can actually stream videos, uh, um, have live chats and conduct these kinds of uh, uh, webinars over the Internet. Uh, um, but what is next? What has started more than five years ago, the development was the development of the next generation wireless system, which is called 5G. And 5G has been deployed nowadays in a few cities around the world uh, with some certain limitations. But the idea of 5G is actually the, not only to provide extremely high speeds as compared to its predecessor, which is about 10 times higher on average, but actually to have a new paradigm in connectivity. We're talking about connecting everything together to kind of have sensory information about cars, about the water supplies, the status of the parks, the buildings, the grid, electrical grid, all of that, your own status, your own health. So we're talking about massive connectivity between equipment, machines, wearables and sensors that will be working together in a huge network architecture. And this is what 5G is trying to implement. Of course, each one of these sectors has its own standards and its own kind of challenges. But in general, this is the 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 the, the conceptual uh, idea behind uh, 5G. So if we look closer about this uh, future generation or this 5G kind of standard, we will see three main pillars or three main uh, categories that can classify the type of connectivity that we're going to be providing in 5G. The first classification is the regular one, which is the enhanced mobile broadband. And this is what, when we talk about extremely high speeds, when we talk about our mobile terminals, we are expecting 10 times, 20 times, up to 100 times uh, a based increase in the data rate, uh, uh, depending on your channel uh, environment and your, 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 your position in with respect to the base station. So this is what we call enhanced mobile broadband where we are looking at extreme high speeds. So we will be able to transfer a complete DVD in a few seconds very soon. Then the other pillar or the other corner or the other classification is actually concerning low latency based uh, applications. And in low latency, we, we, are, we mean we need very fast response. And these kinds of applications are very critical in, for example, in vehicular platforms. We want the car to make a decision in fractions of a second to actually stop and avoid a collision or avoid an accident. So these are life. Life threatening applications that needs very fast response and decisions from the network so that the data is rela relayed to the application to the car to make a decision in extremely uh, 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 fast uh, 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 times and very low delays. So this is called low latency or the ultra high reliability and low latency UHRLL. The third pillar is concerned about massive IoT uh, or massive connectivity. Uh, when with IoT, we, 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 uh, we mean the Internet of Things. And this is where this whole idea of massive connectivity with small big sensors is going to take into place. Of course, here we're talking about applications that don't need very high speeds or very fast responses. So we're talking about sensors, maybe for utility management, for the power grid, things that are not so critical. Your, your, health, your health monitoring system, they don't have to be extremely fast or they don't need maybe that fast response that we would need uh, when we are in a car, for example. So these are the three pillars for 5G uh, uh, standard and then in between we have different kinds of applications that have a combination between high speed, low latency and massive connectivity. Of course, our work is driven by the market need. So just comparing where we are at today with a few years ago, we can see an exponential growth in the amount of data rates that are required and that people are asking for. So we're, we're, we're seeing almost a 50% increase in the amount of annual uh, 
uh, data rate, which is the amount of data that is being used within the networks. Uh, this is a forecast that is showing that our need for data is going to continue in an exponential fashion. The more data we can give, the users will actually take and they will find some use cases and some applications where they will consume all of this. Of course, we can see here that smartphones are the major data hungry devices nowadays. Everybody has a cell phone that is connected to the net, so they are downloading things left and right. And as you can see here, we will see about 10% increase or 5% increase in the amount of data rates within comparing 2020 to the past four years, for example. Machine to machine communications, it's going to increase by about 200% and so on and so forth. So we are looking a massive growth in the amount of data and to be able to fulfill that, we need to come up with technologies that can provide that. This is another projection about the use of uh, technology. As we can see here, even for the coming four years, uh, the 4G standard will still be dominating the market in terms of the protocol in terms of the standard that is carrying all these data rates. Of course, 5G will start penetrating in the coming few years, and then maybe in 2025 we will have um, a 50% market share of the 5G as compared to 4G, but still, there is still a, a, a long way to go because of the delays that we're seeing in deploying 5G networks nowadays uh, all over the world because of the situation, the health situation and the market situation. When we look at the various aspects, the performance matrices comparing 5G to 4G, we can see that this light green over here is the or are the performance matrices of 4G and then this darker green all around is the 5G. So we can see that there's a huge leap between the metrics that we are seeing nowadays in 4G and what we will see in few years from now from 5G. So for example, when we talk about the peak data rates, we're talking about an average of 20 times increase. When we talk about the spectrum efficiency, about three times increase. When we talk about the mobility, we can go up to 500 kilometers per hour uh, uh, users. So very fast high speed trains can actually be communicating with the network. Um, when we talk about the latency, we're going 10 times faster and so on and so forth. So on all aspects, we are seeing a, a tremendous increase and a tremendous uh, improvement when we go from 4G to 5G. Not just that, when we look at the 5G network architecture, we will see a complete change in the network architecture. This is the scenario that we have nowadays with 4G based base stations. As you can see here, we have sectors covered. Everybody within the sector will have kind of a code and they will be able to talk to the base station. In the 5G scenario, we will have a totally different network architecture where we will rely on active phased array antennas with massive MIMO capability to actually shoot specific beams for every user. This will allow us to connect to users at a much further distances because now we have a higher signal to noise ratio, more dedicated beams, and we can reduce the interference in between the connections. So we will have a much reliable, much higher speed based connections because you know the connection quality and speed depends on the signal to noise ratio as well. So if we minimize that, we will have a better experience. So this is, these are the kinds of uh, uh, um, phased arrays that we will be placing on buildings in the coming few years. Actually, some of these, uh, um, some of these um, um, base stations have been deployed in Switzerland, in Korea, and in China. Now, if we look at the actual uh, developments from an industrial point of view, we will see that uh, several companies all over the world have been racing since a few years back to come up with novel solutions in time because 2020 was the date of deployment for 5G. It's it, it will slip a little bit, but we we have seen some 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 deployments already and we have seen some solutions from Qualcomm, from Huawei, and from, from several other companies like Xiaomi and Motorola, LG, Pixel, Samsung. All of these companies have, have, have already built their 5G ready smartphones and the chipsets are ready. Uh, we have phased antenna arrays that are working 
uh, uh, within these kinds of in package uh, 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 solutions. Still, they are not optimal, but we can get now 800 megahertz of bandwidth at millimeter waves, and we can operate at sub six gigahertz with about 3.6 or four gigabits per seconds. So a lot of activities are going all over the world to accomplish and to make 5G a reality. Now I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about and focus on antenna systems in particular and the technologies that are driving the antenna system uh, part. Because as we all know, the antenna system is the actual system that takes your waveforms from the chipsets, from your voice, from your video, transforms it into an electromagnetic wave and sends it over the air. And this interface is extremely important. If it doesn't work well, if it's not well designed, your link, your 5G, 4G, or even 1G link will never work. So the antenna is extremely important in these kinds of future technologies because we need to integrate more antennas. We need to have more features within these antenna systems, as we will see uh, uh, shortly. Of course, the increase in the data rates and the reliability of connections going from 4G to 5G or within 4G and 5G systems is dependent not only on the antenna systems themselves, but on a magnitude, on a multitude of dimensions and a multitude of technologies. Some of these technologies are the utilization of the multiple input, multiple output systems, as I said, as well as the, the, the feature of having beamforming at millimeter waves, the use of advanced modulation and coding schemes. So our, our colleagues that are doing uh, uh, the communication system design, uh, their modulation and coding schemes are extremely important in making the uh, connection speeds and uh, uh, connection reliabilities uh, uh, a reality. Uh, the use of multiple access techniques uh, play a major role. We will see the utilization of smaller cells with ultra densification in 5G for several reasons. One of them is actually the utilization or the use of higher frequencies, which means that the coverage will be smaller. So we need more base stations or more repeaters, more smaller cells. We will have the feature of device to device communication in 5G so that if we are in a critical zone where the coverage is not that good, we can get the coverage from another cell phone or device. The use of millimeter waves, this is a, a, a key technology, as well as the utilization of the concept of massive MIMO and beamforming at the base station end. Of course, we need to understand the fundamentals uh, of, of, of uh, a communication uh, system, uh, and it all goes down to this simple equation uh, that describes the channel capacity. The channel capacity is the amount of information you can send over the channel. And this channel capacity depends in particular on the operating bandwidth. That's why we are always pushing for more bandwidth. It depends on the number of antennas at the receiver and the transmitter size. It depends on the signal to noise ratio and the power of the signal, and it depends on the channel conditions. OK, so there are multiple parameters here that we can play with in order to enhance the data rate and enhance our uh, connection speeds. In a, in a simple MIMO scenario, as we can see here, we have two transmitting channels and three receiving channels, and MIMO is all about exploiting the multipath between the channels and making the multipath to our use. We are utilizing multipath to make the connection reliability and speed better. And as we can see here, this was an early study about MIMO that compared the effect of or that can sh that showed the effect of the antenna coupling on the overall channel capacity. So in the system setup, the authors were comparing one by one conventional uh, 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 SISO scenario uh, with uh, uh, two by two, three by three, and four by four MIMO. As you can see here, in the ideal conditions, when the antennas are almost one lambda apart, one lambda apart at the receiver, one lambda apart at the transmitter, the, the system setup was able to achieve the theoretical limit, a little bit lower than the limit, but almost there. This is the theoretical limit. The straight line is the theoretical limit for each case. So we were around the theoretical limit. We were able to actually achieve that. When we started to make the antennas closer to one another, the coupling 
the, the, the port coupling and the, and the field coupling started to degrade the amount of uh, 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 advantages or data rates that we are getting. So here we actually dropped by about by about 10 bits per second. And then we dropped even more when we made the two antenna systems on the transmitter and the receiver very close to one another. So this actually showed us that we need to pay careful attention to field coupling and port coupling. As you can see here, with high coupling, we have degraded performance and with low coupling, we have an enhanced performance. Of course, um, a lot of standards nowadays are relying on multiple antennas and MIMO. Uh, so we can see here that smartphones, tablets, laptops, USB dongles, vehicle to vehicle communications, we have defined a lot of standards that utilize multiple antennas like here, for example, the AC can go up to eight antenna elements and so on and so forth. Of course, these applications cover a huge wide range of frequency bands starting from 700 megahertz up to 60 gigahertz, depending on the application. And the number of antennas at the user terminal, they vary from two to four now. We can go up to eight in certain applications. It's not yet uh, uh, used in, in, in commercial devices, but it has been tested in the lab. So you can see here that multiband and multi antenna systems are essential for all future communication standards. And it's extremely important to be able to come up with these novel designs um, with practical implications. Here are some 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 examples of multi antenna systems. These are a little bit old, like the Huawei P9 and the Galaxy S5. But the idea is the same nowadays. We are still using multi element, multi band based antenna systems on the edges of the phone to be able to establish the MIMO connections. Now, since we saw already with that initial study, the effect of coupling and the effect of uh, 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 field correlation, we want to go back and come up with some recommendations. How are we going to tackle these two issues when we design our next MIMO antenna system? Of course, the ultimate goal is to have a higher channel capacity. And this can be done with two things in mind. First, we need to have low port isolation so that we can have better efficiency and we need to have low field correlation so that we can have independent channel paths and we can affect the channel capacity in a direct way. So a major misconception that has been floating over the past 10 years is that higher port isolation will provide you with, lo with lower envelope or field correlation. This is extremely not correct. This is only correct in an ideal situation. The analysis should focus on the actual fields because this field correlation is the one that is going to affect your channel behavior here. And this is going to affect directly your channel capacity. So if we go and look at this equation, this is what matters to us. This is what we need to minimize. We need to minimize the correlation between the fields radiated by port one or antenna one and port two. Now, the derivatives that appeared in literature based on the S parameters are only valid for extremely narrow class of antennas under certain conditions, which you are usually not satisfied in any kind of practical design. So please pay attention. I actually uh, 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 reviewed the paper a few days ago, uh, and I, I saw the same mistake. People are still not convinced. They are using these relationships, they are splitting the ground planes, and they are claiming that they are getting a good MIMO system. So if we go to a simple example that to prove that port isolation is not directly related to field coupling, these two patches are well uh, port isolated. The port isolation is about 20 dB. So this is very good, OK? But if we look at their field patterns and we calculate the correlation from the fields and the correlation from the S parameters, there's a huge discrepancy between the two. So we need to be very careful when we analyze and when we claim that our antenna system or our MIMO antenna system 
is going to behave very well. It will not because you need to be careful here. It's the fields. It's not the S parameters. So don't focus only on the port isolation. Port isolation will improve your efficiency. It is well known. So please be careful. The second thing that we want to talk about under the MIMO umbrella is the massive MIMO. Massive MIMO has several advantages. And when we talk about massive MIMO, we're talking about very dense antenna arrays that are capable of producing multiple simultaneous beams so that you can serve multiple users with dedicated beams. So usually this massive MIMO is realizable at the base station side, not at the user terminal side, because we cannot put a lot of antennas on the user terminal. But the advantage of this massive MIMO technique is that we can have noticeable capacity improvement because of the higher SNR, the dedicated channels and the available bandwidth. We can have energy efficiency. Why? Because we can have directive antennas, directive beams, and rather than having few antennas with very high power amplifiers, we can have hundreds of antennas with very small power amplifiers collectively, so we can add them up. So the addition will make the antennas more or the systems more efficient because power amplifiers are extremely inefficient in base stations and they consume the most or more than 50% of the energy supplied for the base station. Of course, when we have lower power components, that means that we can have cheaper components and then we can have a, 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 a cheaper overall system. Uh, well, a cheaper in, in a sense that a uh, pair component. Um, we should have, of course, a reduction in latency, and this is something that is uh, a requirement for 5G critical applications. And of course, we will have robustness against jamming because we have these dedicated beams. Without going into the details of the mathematics, we can see here that the channel capacity of a massive MIMO can be simplified to a simple equation that depends on the SNR and the number of the receiving antennas, N sub R, the receiving channels. So you can see here that this is a like a linear relationship that the higher the SNR, which we can actually guarantee with these kinds of arrays, we can increase the channel capacity in a fundamental way. Of course, in recent years, in the past few years, also people were talking about 3D massive MIMO rather than massive MIMO itself, because in massive MIMO, the uh, communication uh, uh, researchers were focusing on 2D, the azimuth based kind of tilting or beam steering. But now in 3D massive MIMO, we're talking about full 3D beam steering. We're talking about azimuth and elevation. And as you can see here, the correlation of the 3D massive MIMO as compared to the correlation of the 2D massive MIMO resulted in, a, in an interesting kind of a, kind of a, uh, uh, an error. There was an error that people were not looking at because of this simplification of the 2D massive MIMO. So the most accurate one is the 3D massive MIMO. As you can see here, we can see a degradation in the channel capacity when we talk about, you know, uh, sorry, uh, the correlation. When we talk about the difference in the correlation, we can see that a higher uh, correlation value. But when we actually utilize, when we actually utilize the 3D aspect, we can actually improve the overall system performance. Why? Because now we can do elevation and azimuth steering. So our beams will become more decoupled in 3D space if we do the design properly. The second technology that is driving antenna systems or antenna system design in 5G is actually millimeter waves. And in millimeter waves, there is a big advantage, which is they utilize the availability of a wide bandwidth. Uh, and as you can see here, the uh, 28 and 38 gigahertz uh, bands that were approved uh, uh, recently by the FCC in the USA, as well as in other countries, uh, there is at least a one gigahertz of bandwidth in these bands. Comparing it to a few uh, hundreds of megahertz in the sub 6G uh, bands, the millimeter waves are the ones that are going to make you download a DVD 
in just a few seconds on your mobile terminal. Um, of course, the free space path loss, as you can see here, the free space path loss at 28 and 38 gigahertz is still relatively small as compared to 60 gigahertz. So the advantage of using these bands is huge and people have adopted them and we are building the systems already in these bands. Of course, people were arguing that we will have a, an, an, an kind of a, an increase in the path loss because of these higher frequencies. That is correct. But if we have antenna arrays at these bands, we will have an, an added gain. And this added gain, if we can have an added gain of 15 dBi at the, at the transmitter side and 15 dBi at the receiver side, we can actually reach connection coverage areas of up to 300 meters. This is huge for these high frequencies, okay? So worst case scenarios, we can reach up 100 meter radius or 100 meter coverage area. So we can actually make use of these bands in a very practical way. There are some potential challenges in antenna designs for 5G in general. The first one is integration. The integration with the with the with the electronics, with the mechanical systems at both frequencies. So when we talk about 5G now, we're talking about sub six gigahertz as well as millimeter waves. We need to have multi-band coverage, so we want our antennas to cover multiple standards, multiple bands. We need to be aware of the actual design of the terminals, like the metal clearances and so on. Uh, we need to come up with workarounds for the holding gestures because now at millimeter waves, your port, your 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 mobile device will be highly affected by the way you ha you actually put your hand on it. We should always have designs at millimeter waves with dual polarizations for better connectivity. Of course, we will have MIMO and the way we characterize and the way we actually test these systems. These are some general challenges applied to a, a wide spectrum of applications. In the coming sections, I'm going to be talking about some of the advances in antenna systems for 5G that we have been working on in the past I would say eight years. Um, I'm going to go over some reconfigurable uh, antennas for uh, cognitive radio platforms, active integrated antennas, and the fact of co-design, millimeter waves, the idea of connected antenna arrays, then some massive MIMO-based applications, and some generic, uh, um, some generic IoT slash biomedical-based designs. So basically. Some of the technologies that we will be seeing uh, in 5G terminals are going to cover the span or all of these kinds of uh, uh, um, pillars that I just mentioned. So we will see reconfigurable antennas that can switch and cover a wide range of frequency bands. They can switch electronically, uh, or we can have a smart uh, uh, channel sensors that can actually uh, um, um, identify the spectrum gaps. Um, we will have active antennas that are closely designed uh, so that we can have better efficiency uh, between antenna systems. Um, millimeter waves, we will see it in 5G based applications or enabled devices. We have multiple bands based on the region uh, of coverage. Connected antenna arrays, we have developed them for 4G as well as 5G and then massive MIMO, uh, which will be actually deployed in 5G. Uh, uh, base stations. The take home message is that antenna design will always be evolving and we will always be looking for innovative st structures and antenna solutions for the various applications that are still coming. This is a, 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 a pictorial view of a, of a generic mobile handset and as you can see here in 4G we can have or we were focusing on the two edges the top and the bottom where we put two or four uh, uh, LTE advanced base antenna systems that can cover from 700 to 2600 megahertz. Uh, 2600 megahertz. Uh, and when we talk about 5G, in order to be able to have the advantage of massive MIMO, we need to ha have at least four to eight antenna elements 
in the frequency ranges between 3600 megahertz and 4500 megahertz. Uh, and these are expected to be at the edges of the phone. So even if you block some of them, you will still have some connectivity from the others and you will still get a good connection compared to 4G. When we talk about 5G, we're talking about edge based uh, antenna arrays, as I saw you as I showed you in the previous uh, slides from Qualcomm. These are supposed to be put on the edge uh, as part of the metal frame. Uh, uh, and, and they will have a phase antenna array of a two by four or a one by four based uh, uh, patch elements, um, and they will be working at 28 gigahertz and 38 gigahertz, depending on the architecture. But these are the locations that we are expecting to have. Um, um, so this, this, this figure gives you an idea of how crowded the mobile terminal is going to be uh, when you buy uh, your next uh, 5G compatible uh, uh, mobile terminal in the coming year or two. You will have antennas all over. So I'm going to go over the first category, some examples on reconfigurable MIMO antennas. Um, we worked on this uh, more than five years ago, and uh, we have uh, developed uh, the first reconfigurable MIMO antenna systems uh, with compact sizes, uh, with uh, with uh, with a focus on uh, cognitive radios, where we have sensing ultra wideband antennas integrated with communication uh, mobile MIMO antennas, and we were utilizing electronic uh, switching for various band coverages. As you can see here, uh, we have tested the 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 communication bands, the ultra wideband sensing antenna for cognitive radios. And as you can see here, the patterns were actually uh, um, tilted from one another so that we can have better uh, 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 correlation coefficient uh, and, and more isolated MIMO channels. Of course, the reconfiguration was done using uh, electric circuits with pin diodes and varactor diodes. The pin diodes were acting like switches, the varactor diodes were acting like uh, uh, voltage controlled capacitors, and we were able to fine tune and block tune the various elements of the various antennas. Of course, we came up with so many different geometries for so many different applications and we enhanced the actual port isolation using defected ground structures and other and as well as utilizing other techniques. This was one of the hexagonal uh, based reconfigurable antennas that we have developed. This was another one that we have developed for 4G enabled devices. As you can see here, the focus was usually on the edges of the of the terminal or on the edges of the of the back plane of the mobile handphone or mobile handset. Now, in reconfigurable antennas, there are several challenges as well, uh, especially miniaturization, because we want uh, the antennas to be as small as possible so they can be integrated and placed uh, in uh, positions where mechanical engineers will tell you uh, that you are away, that you are allowed to use. So we have to come up with miniaturization techniques to actually fit these antennas within small form factor devices. We have to have large bandwidth because we saw in MIMO, Bandwidth is key. The wider the bandwidth, the higher the channel capacity. We need to have integration with active components uh, like diodes, like amplifiers later on, uh, integration issues within the device shape and gesture, coexistence with other antennas and technologies, wireless LAN, GPS, and so on and so forth, as well as focusing on the periphery of the device rather than putting it inside the backplane. Another concept that is really important and uh, will appear, has appeared uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in 5G and beyond, will be the fact that we want active MIMO antennas. And by active, we mean that co-designing the antenna element with the amplifier. We came up with, the, with a new co-design approach, also uh, several years back, where we actually came up with the first active integrated ultra wideband MIMO antenna covering 1.8 to 5.8 gigahertz, where this whole chain was co-designed together to get better efficiencies and better MIMO performance in terms of a complete system level architecture. Rather than just focusing on the antenna, we should not ignore the previous stages. And just assuming 50 ohm here and 50 ohm there is not always the best and the most efficient. So we proved this in several works that AIA is needed for 5G and will provide 
actually better efficiencies when we do the code design approach. So the code design approach that we came up with was following this kind of uh, um, um, flow chart. I'm not going to go over it in details because it's, it's highlighted in our previous works, but basically we need to optimize the MIMO antenna systems along with the actual active amplifiers and then integrate them in a proper way following you know, design rules so that we can have a better, more efficient antenna system. And when I talk about antenna system, I mean the overall system, the active part and the passive part. Here is a quick example of uh, uh, an active integrated monopole that covers 2.3 to 2.6 gigahertz. So we start with the monopole itself and then we convert its single port to a dual port based uh, 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 um, um, circuit. We need the two port circuit so that we can put it in ADS, for example, to integrate it with the amplifier. So after that, we can actually create our model in ADS or microwave office or whatever tool you would like. And then we can optimize now for the gain circles, noise circles, the efficiencies, the performances, the matching. We can play with all of these parameters in the active side, okay, within our Smith chart. And then we can optimize our amplifier architecture based on the loading of the antenna. So we load the amplifier with the antenna. We should not ignore it and always assume that the antenna is a 50 ohm because the antenna has a, a complex impedance at different frequencies. So we need to be careful when we do that. So this is the procedure or the methodology that we have adopted and we came up with extremely good results as compared to just 50 ohm based designs. As you can see here, this is the uh, performance of the uh, amplifier in terms of the matching, in terms of the noise figure and so on and so forth. And then finally, we integrate the active part with the antenna part and we put them back in CST and we look at the radiation patterns and we see the differences in the gain, for example. Of course, we applied this to all kinds of antennas, narrow band, wide band, ultra wide band. This was, what, this was the uh, ultra wide band antenna design. Uh, even though the, the antenna is a little bit big here, that was not the point. The point here is that uh, we want to prove the concept of co-design and the advantages that we can get. As you can see here, the red curve is showing us uh, um, significant advantages, more than 10% at certain points. And even at the band edge, we have almost 40% increase in the amount of efficiency as compared to the uh, uh, um, cascaded. Cascaded means just you put it 50 ohm to 50 ohm. Although 50 ohm is just one point in frequency, you cannot have 50 ohm over the whole band. OK, so that's having a co-design methodology will actually give you better performance uh, uh, um, over the whole band, not only a single point like in here, for example. Of course, we can get the advantage also in terms of isolation and in terms of matching, as well as in terms of the correlation coefficient. And this was the final design that we have come up with. It's a little bit big, but still we just wanted to prove the concept. Some of the potential challenges of this active integrated methodology are basically uh, active integration, uh, active element feedback. We need to, take, to make sure that the antennas, uh, the, 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 the active parts are stable as well. Uh, integration issues with other parts, coexistence, uh, as well as maybe applying it to millimeter waves. I have not seen it yet, but you know, people are still using the 50 ohm with millimeter waves because they are having a separate chip and a separate antenna array. When we talk about MIMO antennas at millimeter waves, we have also tackled this, this subject uh, early on, almost also six years ago, uh, because this is the time of the publication. The, the actual work started two years before. Um, so several major companies uh, uh, actually started uh, uh, that work at that time, but we had a collaboration uh, and we developed several millimeter wave based switched beam. As you can see here, we have a Butler matrix, so we have a planar array with switched beams so we can have this MIMO based uh, switched beam uh, array. And as you can see here, this was just a single array. So if we could put two arrays, we can have a MIMO. Um, you can see here clearly the different beams that are obtained from the switching uh, characteristics. And this was the 2D uh, pattern that was measured in a chamber. 
as you can see here, the matching was about over uh, um, 800 megahertz or so. We integrated 4G and 5G systems as well uh, that operated at sub six gigahertz as well as millimeter waves, but this was a design with a fixed beam. Um, and as you can see here, uh, we uh, adopted the multi-layer approach. Uh, uh, this was the first 4G, 5G antenna system, and this is an exploded view of the multiple layers. As you can see here, we have the uh, uh, 4G antennas and then the 5G antennas in the, in the ground plane, and then we have the, uh, 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 um, the feeding network at the back side. These are the 4G elements. This is the 5G array. And these are the, the design evolution of the 4G antenna element and then the design, the performance, the performances of the low band and the high band. And as you can see here, we are we have a very good, we have a very good uh, wide bandwidth at the millimeter waves and a wide bandwidth at the at the um, uh, subsidy gigahertz bands. And these are the patterns at millimeter waves. As you can see here, they are directional patterns. We had 2.4 gigahertz of bandwidth at millimeter waves and about 0.5 gigahertz of bandwidth at sub-6 gigahertz. Uh, another example at millimeter waves was using a DRAs. And as we all know, DRAs are known for their higher efficiency at higher bands because they are non-metallic. So their radiation efficiency is extremely high as compared to patches, for example, at millimeter waves. We came up with the first uh, uh, beam switchable, uh, uh, fixed beam switchable, uh, MIMO antenna array at millimeter waves also a long time ago, um, and it was operating around 30 gigahertz. It consists of two sub arrays of cylindrical, uh, cylindrical DRAs uh, with uh, fixed uh, feeding networks to tilt the beams left and right. I'm going to speed up a little bit. I think I'm running out of time. Um, I think I have 10 minutes. Uh, so these are these were the actual prototypes and the measurements. As you can see here, the radiation patterns, the prototypes, and the actual measured fields. Then we also calculated the uh, um, correlation coefficient uh, based on the S parameters and based on the 3D patterns. Here, there is a good match between the two because of the high efficiency of the antennas and the tilted beams. The fourth example on millimeter waves was this recent design that uh, we have done. Uh, and uh, it was based on a four by four uh, uh, dual polarized patched array. We had a multi-layer based PCB design. It covered 26 to 29 gigahertz. Um, this is the uh, details of the dual polarized patch antenna um, and how it looks like in a single element. It had a sub super straight on top of it. Um, these are the measured and simulated results. They matched very well with a gain of five dB and then we built a very wide band Butler matrix based on modified uh, elements. As you can see here, a wide band coupler, a wide band crossover and a wide band phase shifter. And the array had two parts, one for the horizontal polarization, the other for the vertical polarization. And then we had power dividers for the two so that we can feed the antennas at two points each. The results were very good, very wide band. Uh, and the beams were behaving very well at different frequencies. And as you can see here, the different beams are switchable in the proper directions as we anticipate. Of course, potential challenges, again, the feeding network design, the co-design with active networks are very uh, uh, green spaces for, uh, for these kinds of uh, designs, as well as the typical MIMO challenges with characterization and beam forming. Um, another technology or another way of looking at things, we developed connected antenna arrays. Of course, the concept of connected antenna array is not new, but we actually took that into another dimension. Comparing connected antenna arrays with regular arrays, regular arrays are separated. Each element is separate from the other, like this. And as you can see here, there's a, a separation distance. This will give the current distribution a maxima at the center and a minima at the edge. But when we short all these antennas together, we will have a current distribution that looks like a constant. A constant current fundamentally means infinite bandwidth. And this is the idea. If we look at the, derivate, the derived equations, which are a little bit involved, I'm not going to go over them, but the impedance here is independent of frequency. And this is the catch. If you have an impedance that is independent of frequency, then you can have an array or a, 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 an antenna that has very wide bandwidth. We took this concept and we applied it on mobile terminals. We 
came up with dual function based connected arrays where they acted at the low band as a defective ground structure and at the high band as an array or a planar array. And we actually uh, uh, did this uh, uh, several years back as well, and we proved it at different frequency bands. We tested the isolation. We looked at the actual coverages and the bandwidths were very good. When we fabricated it, we measured the patterns, we measured the actual uh, gains, and we also got acceptable results. Of course, here we have a backlog because these are slots, and the slots are radiating in both directions. Of course, when we look at the gains also, we had very good uh, performance for these kinds of antennas. We applied it also on another kind of uh, uh, antenna system, but now at 30 gigahertz with a single slot, and also we integrated 4G and 5G MIMO arrays in a single handset device. This is the uh, details of the single element wideband 4G antenna element, and this is the uh, uh, um, design evolution. And as you can see here, we still got very good wideband uh, coverages at 5G as well as 4G. These were the patterns, as you can see, they were tilted, and this was the pattern at, at, at millimeter waves. Again, it's very uh, uh, noisy because of the use of a single slot uh, and the, the the presence of a backing reflector. Another technology for 5G is massive MIMO, and as, as I mentioned, we are talking about hundreds of elements like in here and there. Um, what we are looking for is improved capacity, reduction in latency, energy efficiency, inexpensive low, low part, power parts, and the robustness against jamming because of the multiple simultaneous beams. Um, we're talking about operating frequencies from 3 to 30 gigahertz initially. Um, I haven't seen much millimeter wave based massive MIMO yet, but yes, sub 6 gigahertz is very well known. This was our own design where we developed this kind of 288 patch element based three sector 72 port massive MIMO array. We developed it in our lab and here are the beam concentrations from each phase. We actually calculated the total uh, fields with predefined uh, uh, phase tilts for every subarray. Uh, for massive, for for millimeter wave massive MIMO, there were several works from uh, uh, Professor Hong's, uh, Professor Wei Hong's group in China, where they developed these kinds of massive MIMO millimeter wave based systems. They developed the antenna arrays, all the active parts. And they got all these beautiful beams uh, in their labs. Of course, it's extremely expensive to build these kinds of systems because they are extremely complicated, as you can see. So their group is really large, more than 100 people in the research group, but they actually succeeded in developing the first millimeter wave based massive MIMO connectivity uh, between their buildings in, in Shanghai. The last one, the last uh, pillar that I want to talk about is actually uh, uh, um, IoT and, and other biomedical based applications. And in here, we need massive kind of miniaturization. We need extremely small sizes so that we can put these in skin, in capsule or whatever, and then we can actually operate them at very, very low frequency bands. Um, the challenge here is that once you go with an electrically small antenna, you will have extremely narrow band behavior as well as omnidirectional radiation patterns. We've developed also biomedical sensors to detect the amount of water inside the lungs. We succeeded with that and we de developed also switched beam antenna arrays for vehicle to vehicle communications um, with, with, uh, with the UG for UGVs for uh, ground vehicles. And as you can see here, the patterns were shifted and tilted based on the switching uh, 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 combinations. When we look about future challenges, this is a, a like a block diagram of a 5G radio architecture. Um, my group's focus has been this part, the multiband RF front ends. We are now investigating and integrating energy harvesting capabilities, wireless char charging applications, and multiple RF sensor based devices. All of these at the front end of any kind of uh, architecture. Uh, that is going to come by, come 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 out or come by in the near future. So this is our focus for future collaboration. If some of you are interested, so we have talked about these three parts, and of course to wrap up, 
some of the potential challenges. These are my personal views. Again, active integration with miniaturization of antennas, coming up with on-chip, on-package, or in-package based antenna array solutions with beamforming and active integration. The testing and characterization is always a challenge. Coming up with CAD tools that can predict in a timely fashion the response of your big arrays is always uh, an evolving uh, um, 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 area. Health issues, big question mark, and beyond 5G. We're now talking about 6G. We're talking about 100 gigahertz and beyond. So we are always striving for the ultimate integration between antennas, electronics, and algorithms. Of course, our years of research were summarized in two major books. Uh, one that was out in 2014 and the other was out in 2018. And I encourage you to encourage your libraries to get copies of these books and uh, utilize them in your uh, next projects for antenna design and integration. And let me know if you have comments on them, of course. Um, with this, I'm going to close. I think I am exactly on time. It's one hour. Um, thank you all for uh, listening, and I will be more than happy to answer uh, a few questions if time allows. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Sharabi, uh, for a very nice and informative talk. And there were many interesting antenna designs for 5G that give us a very good insight on uh, what the future will look like and uh, what are the direction in which we should do research. Uh, so both of your books are in our library and many of our students are regularly using them as reference, especially the one who were working on my antennas. And I'm very sure that soon uh, we will also be using your book on the ant uh, integrated antenna design. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, let us take some questions which are from the audience. Uh, sure. So, uh, so one first question is: uh, the Bumail user within a cell are not much separated in elevation. So, how will the 3D MIMO antenna on a base station help? Uh, perhaps he want to ask where, uh, that the beam should steer only in the azimuth direction. There is no need for the beam stability in the elevation plane. That that's a good point. But now, when we're talking about 5G. We are not only talking about pedestrians. We will be talking with traffic lights. We will be talking about a higher elevated base structures. I don't want to go to the first uh, to uh, uh, one of the first slides um, uh, very quickly. I'm sorry. I'm going uh, uh, slowly with uh, with this button. But uh, uh, for example, when we look at this, when we look at this picture, you see the 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 base stations will be talking with. Uh, multiple objects at different levels of elevation. You are correct. If we are talking about only pedestrians, yes, you might not be able to distinguish them if they were on the street. But if you are talking about with me, for example, I'm now one level below the street, by the way. And if you are talking with, for example, my neighbor, who's actually three meters above me in the third floor, okay, then you will have an elevation kind of uh, 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 an elevation difference. So we cannot assume always that we are all on the same elevation plane because we are all on the street. We are not all on the street. I can be in a building on the third floor and my colleague will be on the street. So there will be a difference in elevation. So from that perspective, taking the elevation into account will make a difference, especially when we have these 3D beam steerable uh, 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 um, uh, massive MIMO base station antenna systems. So. The, the the resolution in elevation will make a difference now when I go a little bit lower or a little bit higher because the difference is going to be several meters. Okay. So I hope Thank this kind so. of this kind of uh, answers the question. So it's it's yes it's it's sometimes we think of the regular case of yes we are all on the same level we, there isn't much difference it's true but when we talk about now some some extreme cases we're talking about we're talking with also we're talking with maybe some other uh, base stations that are connected on building sites. We're talking uh, with towers that are maybe on 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 uh, on a traffic light. Uh, we're talking with a with a with a camera, for example. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, placed on a on a power on a power on a power uh, uh, on a power cable tower. So there will be an elevation difference, and that's that's something we should take care of, I think, if we are looking at a conceptual holistic uh, view 
of how 5G will be. Thank you, sir, for a very detailed answer. And because 5G is going to be an enabling technology for uh, so many new things like Internet of Things and smart cities. And one of the major thing uh, might also be uh, the quadcopters and uh, UAVs kind of thing. So 5G yes. might be communicating with them. So maybe of course. Uh, those can also be the one which will be communicating through the base station at Absolutely. different elevations. Uh, so, sir, the next question is uh, about uh, the measurements at 28 and 38 gigahertz, the design that we make. Uh, so the question says, uh, are the connectors included in the modeling simulation that you have shown in your presentation? And the second question, uh, which is tied to the same question, is that connectors are only used for testing and might have effect on antennas. So how do we de-embed their effect as they are not required when the antennas actually uh, used uh, in a subsystem board where it has to be finally used? Yes. Um, the first question. Yes, I ask all my students to have the connectors in their models, in their final model. They have to be there, especially when we talk about miniaturized antennas or small antennas. Whenever you have a small antenna, if the ground plane is not, for example, if you have some slots on the ground plane and the ground plane is not you know, fully isolating the connector from the antenna, the connector can be part of your antenna. So if you don't include it, you will have a totally different result. So even if you have a very well matched, you know, uh, 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 antenna with uh, with a stable current distribution, if you put the for these kinds of antennas, which are the majority of the antennas, if they are not electrically small, then adding the connector should be done with care also. You need to put it, but ideally it's nothing but a, a, a 50 ohm match with the port of the antenna. So if they are well matched, then the placement of the connector might not do much in your measurements. But again, as I said, when we have dense antennas, when we have uh, closely placed connectors, we can have you know coupling between the connectors that is faster than the ground plane because the connectors are closer to each other from the top side. So bottom line, in, a, in short, yes, we need to connect. Uh, we need to model the connectors in our models early on. Two, they will have an effect based on the antenna structure, geometry, shape that you are using. It depends. Uh, I cannot say one answer fit all, but you should always put the connector. In reality, when we put the antenna with the actual electronics, that needs to be, again, another integration issue. We need to model the actual IC, or at least the, play, the, the package of the IC and the feeding line coming out of the IC to our antenna in our model, and then we need to replicate that and measure it in the um, in the uh, measurement setup, for example, in the test bed, following the same thing. If we want to have apples with apples, if we want to have extremely accurate modeling versus measurement results, we need to have whatever is in the modeling should be in the measurement, whatever is in the measurement should be in the modeling, so that all the effects are being taken care of at the same time. So this is what I ask my students to do. The connector should always be there. They model with the connector and without the connector to see the differences. But again, as I said, it all depends on the antenna geometry and the antenna type itself. Some antennas are insensitive. Others that are really miniaturized are extremely sensitive. When we talk about millimeter waves, yes, the connector might be actually bigger than your antenna. So we need to be careful. That's why at millimeter waves, we don't put the connectors close to the antennas. We rather put them far away so that they don't load the antennas, but rather we have a feeding network or we have few lines that will take care of this, whether you are using uh, SIWs, uh, uh, substrate integrated waveguides to minimize the loss, or we are using uh, a coplanar waveguide based kind of architecture, regardless. Usually the connectors are put away from millimeter wave based antennas because they can easily load them and they can easily affect their, they can affect their radiation pattern as well. The connector is a metal, so they can tilt the beam if the patch is close to the connector, for example. I hope I answered your question. Is it Thank clear? you, sir. 
uh, I believe it will be uh, it will be clear for the audience. Uh, thank you very much for the very detailed answer. So let me take one last question, sir. Yes. Uh, so this is that uh, in uh, one of your 2014 review paper, it was explained why field correlation is not relating to the coupling of antenna. Uh, however, which is better uh, to reduce field correlation, uh, pattern reconfiguration or use of decoupling structure? I mean, each one, each one has its own direct effect. Reducing the port, reducing the port coupling, or increasing the port isolation will always benefit you in terms of efficiency. When there is high port coupling, that means that a lot of energy is going from port one to port two, and it's coming back. So you are losing part of your efficiency just in that connection. So you want to minimize this kind of power that is being routed and coming back to the other port, for example, through the ground plane or through the connector. All right. Now, when it comes, or of course, uh, of course, uh, uh, through through also, it can be also through the field. The field can couple and you can actually get some energy from it. So. You need to minimize. You need to have acceptable. Here is the catch. You can have 15 dB or 10 dB of port isolation, and yet have good MIMO channel capacity. Why? Because your beams are isolated, or your 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 field correlation is high. The field correlation is more dramatic, is more important. If you are if you are well. They are both important, but if you are given a choice, this or that, period. So you would choose, you would choose, um, you would choose a field uh, field correlation because field correlation will actually give you um, uh, field correlation will actually make sure that your channel capacity is respected. Your channel capacity is actually going to be fulfilled. The channel capacity will be slightly affected by maybe the port coupling, but not as much as the field coupling, because that is the key component in that equation. The channel matrix is based on the field relationships between the transmitters and the receivers. So. In a nutshell, you need to optimize, you need to reduce both. But the one that is going to have direct consequences on your ECC or CC is going to be the field correlation. Put the two fields on top of one another, like here. I showed the example. I showed this example, OK? This example is clear. So in this example, the coupling, the port coupling is low. But yet, when we look at the fields and we correlate, there is a huge discrepancy. So this is going to affect you directly in terms of channel capacity as compared to port coupling. Is it clear? Uh, thank you very much, sir, for a very detailed answer. I'm very sure that it will be very clear to uh, the person who asked the question. Uh, sure. So just uh, because of the time, I'm not taking any more questions, sir. I am really grateful to you for your time and for a very nice and informative presentation. My pleasure. And thank and you guys for inviting me and uh, for organizing uh, this uh, nice webinar. Oh, thank you, sir. And I really hope to see you uh, uh, here physically in future. Sometimes when we'll be holding our conference. Inshallah. Our back Inshallah. Tomorrow. Inshallah. Thank you guys so much. You have a wonderful evening. And uh, thanks for the audience for their patience and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you, everyone. Uh, the video of this talk will be available on the RIMS YouTube channel. So if you want to listen to this talk again, uh, you can uh, check it on our uh, YouTube channel. Thank you very much and a good evening. Thank you. Bye bye, guys.